Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Fegley, and I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement for the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Welcome to the first Wise Habits talk, Walking the Camino de Santiago as a Marian Devotion. The purpose behind the Wise Habits series is to showcase the fruits of the intellectual formation we offer here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Every friar from the province of the most holy name of Jesus receives their education at our school. These men are the pastors in our parishes. They run ministries throughout the province and they are the professors at the DSBT. This formation equips all of our students, religious and lay, to bring the good news of Christ to the world. Our distinguished speaker this evening is Father Bartholomew Hutcherson. Father Bart is a Dominican friar and itinerant preacher for the province of the Most Holy Name of Jesus, and is an adjunct professor of homiletics at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Father Bart uses storytelling, teaching, retreats, and pilgrimages to share the gospel, all rooted in a deep love for the word of God and a Catholic understanding of sacred scripture. We are very excited to have him with us tonight. So welcome Father Bart and thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Brian. It is a thrill to be here. I have to, uh, I have to be honest that nobody used words like distinguished and intellectual when they invited me to give this talk. So I'm sorry if you, Brian, or others will be, uh, will, will be disappointed by the lack of distinguishedness and the lack of, uh, the lack of distinction and the lack of intellectual um, uh, that, that goes in, that went into the put together, putting together of this talk. Uh, it is, a, it's thrilling to be here. I'm so excited to uh, initiate this, uh, this new uh, Wise Habits series. Uh, I was involved in the, in, in the planning from the beginning and, and was honored to be asked to offer the first, uh, uh, the first talk. These talks are going to offer some popular um, theology and uh, devotional understanding and, and uh, popular piety and popular, uh, popular spirituality. I would say that, that uh, my talk is in the, in the vein of popular spirituality. I was blessed to walk the Camino de Santiago during my sabbatical in the 2014-2015 school year. Uh, I actually walked beginning on April the 20th. Uh, I walked until uh, June the 1st when I arrived in Santiago and I'll say more about that. My talk is gonna be divided this way. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, this, what the uh, Camino de Santiago is for those who perhaps don't know uh, exactly what's involved in the Camino, give a little bit of history of it. I'm going to show you kind of what, what it looks like to walk the Camino. And then I'm going to talk about motivation. I'm going to talk about some old motivations, some modern motivations. And then I'm going to talk very specifically about my motivation and show you how that motivation shifted even in the middle of my walking. So I'm, most of the talk, I'm going to have a slideshow up. So I'm going to put those slides back up now. And then we can begin. Oh, there will be a time of Q&A at the end of my talk. I invite you to put the questions that you have on the Q&A uh, on the Q&A part of the of the webinar. And uh, please tell me where you're where you're writing from, especially if it's someone that I don't know. Uh, right, tell me uh, what city or town you're writing from, and ask your question. And I'll be addressing the questions at the end of the talk. So let's get the slides up again and start the slideshow. And so I'm having trouble advancing my, oh, hold on just a second. I think I know the problem. I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. I'm not sure what the issue is. These are technical difficulties that I don't like. Hold on just a moment. Um, it's such back to speaker view. Hmm? Switch back to speaker view. So sharing the screen. Okay. All right, let me. Let me just do one, do one thing with the slides real quick here. Mm, 
ठीक है Forgive me for this technical difficulty. I'll be right with you momentarily. Okay, let's try this again. Technology is great until it's not great. Um, Uh, hold on just a second. All right, let's try that one more time. All right, there we go. All right, so I, I the first thing I'll let you know is that I uh, I actually changed the title of this talk uh, when uh, when I first started uh, preparing it. Uh, to discovering the Blessed Mother on the Camino de Santiago. Uh, and the reason that I, I, I wanted to put it that way is because technically this, uh, this, uh, uh, this pilgrimage is not really a Marian pilgrimage as we normally think of it, but it became that for me. So what exactly is the Camino de Santiago? Well, the Camino de Santiago is a series of uh, pilgrimage routes from all over Europe that converge on the French-Spanish border. You can see there between the green of France and the yellow of Spain, there's a change in line from blue to red. And they, all, of these, uh, all of these routes converge in the Pyrenees Mountains from all over Europe. They converge in the Pyrenees Mountains at a place called, um, mostly at a place called Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port. Uh, so uh, St. John at the foot of the door. And, uh, uh, and that begins, begins the route across Spain for 500 miles to the small village of, uh, of, uh, um, of Santiago, uh, Santiago de Compostela uh, in Galicia, very near the Atlantic coast of Spain. Uh, and they come here to this church, to the cathedral church of the 11th century, 12th century cathedral of Santiago. Uh, and the reason that they come to this place is because uh, from, the, from the ninth century, uh, there is a legend that, that St. James, that the relics of St. James, the body of St. James, the bones of St. James uh, were discovered in this place in Galicia. Uh, and, that, uh, and then the church was built on top of that place that the bones were found. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how James got, how. Um, uh, how the relics got there a little bit later, but let's just say that, that the reason that James is connected to this space is because the legend says that after Jesus' ascension to the Father, St. James himself went to Spain, the disciples dispersed throughout the world, and he took the gospel to the furthest west end of the known world at that time into Roman Hispania and began preaching there. I'll tell you a little bit more about that a little bit later, but because of that, his relics ended up there miraculously. And from the, uh, from the ninth century until now, it's believed by some people that St. James's relics are still there. Uh, and uh, the cathedral was built, the church was built right on top of the place where his relics were found, making uh, this church only one of three in the entire world built on top of a saint's grave. The others being St. Peter's in Rome uh, and St. Thomas in India. And so that's why people go there. That's, that's why this became a pilgrimage route. The, this, is the, this is what the church looked like when I arrived uh, at it in, uh, in 2014. They were doing some work on the facade in one of the towers. So much of it was covered. As a matter of fact, there was major parts of this front part of the church that I couldn't get into at that time. But uh, the, the route itself, is, it's not the destination, it's the, it's the walk itself. And I want to share with you, um, so these are some, that's an inside picture of the church. That's the, the 13th century image of St. James that's, em, that's embraced by those who, can, who, make, uh, who, who make the pilgrimage. And then there's the, the reliquary itself below the high altar uh, that contains the relics of St. James. So I want to share with you the countryside just to give you a sense of what it's like to walk from the Pyrenees Mountains to Spain before I talk a little bit about uh, the motivations for doing this. So 
These, pic these first pictures start uh, in the French countryside on the north side of the Pyrenees. And, and that's, I began walking uh, on the north side of the Pyrenees and then made my way to Saint-Jean. And then from there, I crossed the Pyrenees mountains. And these are, these are pictures, these images are pictures going through the Pyrenees. Uh, you can see going uphill uh, a great deal of the day. It, I walked in, this was still April, and so there was still snow on the ground in some places, some places even um, uh, blocking, the snow was blocking the route and we had to make our way around it. Through the woods into Navarre, the Basque country at Pamplona, and then across the uh, across the fields of flowers, wildflowers uh, in the Basque country itself, making our way through woods, over hills and dales, across the fields, making our way through much of the, uh, uh, the agricultural north of Spain. Uh, and many places, the, the route of the pilgrimage crosses through uh, these vast agricultural lands. Over hills more into the, La Meseta. The Meseta is the part of Spain that's a, a flat plain. It's the uh, plains in which the rains of Spain so famously remain. And we made our way across the Meseta from Burgos, mostly flat, but some hills, ups and downs, little places along the way. Again, you're seeing small villages that we passed through, places where we had to cross smaller mountains, smaller hills across the fields of, of, uh, uh, of sheep and cattle. Uh, and, and you see long distances. There were places where the Camino walked right by the highway, uh, as you see it here, other places where it went through the fields. Uh, we made our way across you, into the, eventually into the uh, uh, Cantabrian mountains and the Galician countryside. This is back to, hills, to hill country again. Much of this is very green, rain rich, uh, although I didn't experience any rain in this part of it. Uh, many people think that this part of Galicia looks like Ireland because of the fields and the, the rock walls. Here you see a, a, Galician, um, a Galician traffic jam. Uh, and, uh, and then through fields and mount, through a fields and forest, uh, making our way all, uh, the 500 miles to Santiago. These pictures, the pictures of me there were on the road were taken by a Korean Pilgrim, a pilgrim who sent them to me later. These were at some my starting place, and this was my ending place at uh, at the ocean, uh, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. Along the way, uh, in the places that you stop to eat or or drink or or um, or sleep, uh, you're given sellos or stampas. These are these are in, indicate in your pilgrimage route the places that you've been and record your your pilgrimage along the way in your credential of pilgrimage. A typical day on the Camino. People find this interesting. So I walked in the springtime, and uh, and so and, and I had good weather. I had rain the first week I walked, but the, on May the first, I walked into Pamplona in the in a pouring rain. It was it was crazy, and but never had rain again for the rest of my for the rest of my um, uh, my pilgrimage, which basically corresponded with the month of May. But each day, basically, get up around six o'clock, dress, pack. Uh, have some uh, a light, something to eat, usually some coffee and a pastry, and then start walking and uh, be on the road walking until you start, take a break for uh, take a break for a lighter, uh, a more substantial meal a little bit later in the morning. Usually, you want to get some protein in that meal, so uh, so there were some options for that from some meat and eggs along the way. Uh, but then continue walking, uh, depending on what time your earlier break was, noon, one o'clock. You might stop again for lunch, usually a lighter lunch and a cold drink. And then you'd continue walking. The goal was to walk five or six, six hours a day and to be finished before three o'clock to be in your, to be in your, uh, your albergue or, or hostel uh, by three o'clock because then you needed a shower, do laundry. I wore my habit, so I had to wash my habit most days uh, and then maybe have a beer and take a little nap. Then in the evening, I would go and I'd participate in the pilgrim mass in the town where I was and sometimes celebrate that mass have more beer, eat dinner, drink, uh, eat dinner, have more beer, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then have some fellowship, journaling time with, and usually by nine o'clock, most days I was asleep. Now, at this time in the springtime, it was still, still daylight out at nine o'clock. So I was going to sleep often with the light still in the, in the sky. Um, and so, uh, so that was a typical day. And I did this over and over and over again uh, for the 40, uh, 40 plus days that I walked. 
So what are some of the motivations uh, that make people walk 500 miles across Spain? Well, I would say that motivations have certainly changed from when the pilgrimage route developed in the Middle Ages. So beginning in the ninth century, people started going there because they believed that the, the uh, because they believed that the relics of an apostle were there. And it became one of the most popular routes in the Middle Ages for pilgrimage. Uh, it was, there were, the others were, uh, were places like Rome and the Holy Land when it was safe to do that. And of course, Canterbury in England. But pilgrimage was a, was a penitential practice, and each of these each of these pilgrimage routes had attached to them a plenary indulgence. So if you made the if you made that route if you made the the, the pilgrimage successfully and received the credential that said that you had had arrived in Santiago, there was a there was a plenary indulgence attached to it. So people went for penitential reasons. There are even records of people who were released from prison early on the promise that they would make the pilgrimage to Santiago as a sign of their penitence. And so, so it was very, very much a penitential practice, a devotional practice at that time to seek the favor of the saint perhaps, or to seek the indulgence that was attached to the pilgrimage itself. When I talked to people about why they wanted to walk the Camino, it was amazing to me the number of reasons that people gave. People do it as a fitness exercise. I even met one woman who was running the Camino uh, from England and she, she, uh, she, was, she had gotten people to sponsor her and was raising money for breast cancer awareness in honor of a relative who had died of breast cancer. So that's an interesting motiva motivation. People do it for people do it for hiking. People do it as a bucket list uh, as a bucket list item, just for the challenge of doing it. Some people do it because their friends are doing it. Some people are do it literally. I met young people who didn't have a job and couldn't find a job, and they didn't have anything better to do. And so somebody said to them, "Hey, let's walk the Camino," and they walked the Camino. It was surprising to me how many people could not articulate their motivation or their reason for walking. They just did it because. Somehow they found out about it and they thought it might be something fun to do. And so they just walked the Camino, but didn't really have any motivation. And then, of course, there were those who had spiritual motivations as well. Catholics who really understood the, under, the, the idea of pilgrimage and, uh, and allowed themselves to, to take the time and the energy to make this long walk as a spiritual or penitential practice um, and as, as part of their spiritual journey. And so, um, so there, there were those, those people who didn't know why they were walking, they usually found a reason as they walked along the way. Reasons came up for them uh, as, they, as they met people, as they experienced the, the exertion of it, as they experienced the difficulty of it. Often as we neared Santiago, people could begin to articulate what this meant for them and what, what they were getting out of it as they went along the way. So I want to talk now about my motivations for walking. So I walked to encounter Santiago. I walked because Santiago is mi tocayo. Tocayo is a Spanish word that means namesake, but it's much more than a namesake. A namesake, it's, it's a term of endearment. When you, when you call someone your tocayo, it's a very positive, it, they share your name, but not only they share your name, they, um, they, um, uh, they, they, they share something of your life as well. So I think of Santiago as mi tocayo. Well, how is that true? My name is Bart and his name is Santiago. Well, Bart is my religious name and, some, and the name that my parents gave me when I was born was James. And I first encountered the name Santiago in Spanish class in high school. My Spanish teacher, like so many Spanish teachers in the US, called each of us by the Spanish version of our names. And so she gave me the choice, Jaime or Santiago, and I chose Santiago. And, but I didn't understand how Santiago was James. And so I looked it up. I went to the Google of my day. I looked in the Encyclopedia Britannica and I found Santiago and found out that the name Santiago is Sant, it's two words, Sant, holy, and Iago, Jacob, Iago. Uh, it, it's, the, it, it's the Arabic form of the name Jacob or James. And so Santiago is St. James. And so for, high, for much of high school, I went by the name Santiago for an hour a day. But I also first there at 14 years old read about the Camino de Santiago. And I knew 
when I was 14 years old, someday I would walk this route. I didn't know that much about it. I had a lot to learn about it and it took a lot of years, but ultimately from the time I was 14, I knew that I was gonna make the journey and the longer I lived and the more I entered into my life as a Dominican, I knew that I wanted to make the route. And so it was the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. I wanted to get to know St. James. I wanted to get to know my scriptural namesake. And so I, so I decided that on the route, part of my motivation would be each day to read some portion of the story of St. James from scripture. And so I began by compiling a list of all the ways that St. all the places that St. James is mentioned in the four gospels. There are sometimes they're listed here, but where St. James is mentioned uh, in conjunction with his brother, John, or with his, with Peter and his brother, John. So Peter, James, and John seem to be some sort of an inter, inner circle for Jesus's ministry. And so, uh, and, and so they, um, uh, and so I, I wanted to see all those stories where Peter, James, and John, or James and John showed up to see what they might tell me about my ministry, about who James was, uh, and what my patron might have to teach me about life as a follower of Jesus. In addition to all of those places where Jesus is mentioned, where John is mentioned by, excuse me, where James is mentioned by name explicitly, there are other places where he's just in the account with the other disciples. So he would have been present at the Last Supper, the post-resurrection appearances in the upper room, the Great Commission where Jesus sends his disciples out to preach at the Ascension on, uh, on Mount, the Mount of Olives and at Pentecost. These are places in scripture where he's mentioned, not mentioned by name, but he's part of the disciples that would have gathered. And so those were important stories for me to read as well. And then there's that one time, only one time in all of scripture in the New Testament where St. James is mentioned without his brother, without Peter, without Andrew, without the other disciples. And that, of course, is the mention of his martyrdom in Acts chapter 12, where we're told that King Herod laid hands upon some members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by a sword. So James appears only there by himself. But then there's the traditional material that tells us that James also went to Spain after, uh, after the ascension of Jesus, that that was his mission field, that he went as far west as he could. And so I gathered all this material together. I, I had most of it in my cell phone. I could, I could simply read the, from the scriptures. I could look up information on the, on the internet. I was just going to get to know more and more about me tocayo. I was going to get to know more and more about St. James. And the the and of course the 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 pilgrimage route, the San, the the Camino de Santiago uh, did not disappoint me. Not only did I get to read about St. James and learn more about St. James and really memorize all the ways that St. James is mentioned in the scriptures, but then along the way I also got lots of images of St. James. He's everywhere on the Camino, of course. Uh, as the patron of, pilgrim, of pilgrims, as the patron of, uh, of those who, who travel uh, for the sake of, of, uh, of walking with the Lord and getting to know him more. So I encountered his image many, many ways along the, uh, um, along the Camino. So how did my desire to get to know more about St. James turn into a Marian pilgrimage? And I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've really got five answers to that question that I'll give you that show, they'll show how this actually trans, how this transformed more and more into a Marian pilgrimage. Well, first of all, I have to say, it's because I walked in the month of May. And of course, May is the month of Mary. And so I was conscious of that, even as I chose my time that the vast majority of my time, even though I started in April, I, I was going to be walking in May, and so I would have opportunities to get to know Mary a little bit more there too. But in addition to it being the month of May, I also walked uh, from a place that's very special to me. I decided that because Lourdes, France was so close to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, and there is a route that takes you from Lourdes to Santiago, I decided I would start my pilgrimage after a few days of prayer in Lourdes. And so again, I, I'm so attuned to, when I'm in Lourdes, I'm so attuned to the Blessed Mother and her appearance there and praying the rosary with, with the thousands of pilgrims who are there day after day. 
Uh, and because this place is very special to me, I started with Mary on my mind. I started with the Blessed Mother already in my heart. And what that did for me was it added another, uh, another, 500, another 100 miles to my route. So most of the time you'd start at St. Jean-Pierre-de-Fort and you'd make your way across to Pamplona, Legroño, uh, Burgos, León, Astorga, Ponterrada, and then on to Santiago de Compostela. But I wanted to add some more there. So I added another 100, uh, another 100 miles to my trip by starting in, uh, in Santiago. Uh, and ending at, at the, at the seacoast at, uh, uh, at Finisterra. Um, so my, my route was not 500 miles, it was 600 miles. So the next reason, well, I'm a Dominican. You know that most Dominicans wear the rosary on our side. And so everything is, a, is, is in one sense a, a Marian devotion for us, but certainly going to Lourdes, this image, the, the other two images that you see here besides the Dominican rosary, is the, the image of the Blessed Mother, Our Lady of the Rosary, giving the, the rosary to St. Dominic. And this is on the front of the Basilica at Lourdes. And so I was reminded of my Dominican devotion to the Blessed Mother. And so that becomes a third reason why Mary is very much a part of the experience that I'm going to walk. My part, I was in Spain partly because I spent six months of my sabbatical there. And one of the things that I learned traveling around Spain in between my classes uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, um, uh, in the Spanish countryside is that every town, every village, every wide spot in the road has a virgin. The, there are so many different images of the Blessed Virgin that populate Spain and are important to the devotion of that region. A lot of these stories have, uh, a lot of these images have some miraculous story of finding or creating the image that's, a, that's, that's part of the lore that goes with it. And so the Spaniards are very much in tune uh, to devotion to the Blessed Mother. And so I would encounter her every bit as much along the way as I encountered Saint Don, uh, Saint uh, Santiago. She was everywhere. And so as a Dominican who's devoted to Lourdes and devoted to the idea that the Blessed Mother is with us in all these different places, I was so blessed to see these beautiful images from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and even into the 20th century, beautiful images of the Blessed Mother that are held in great esteem and as, as, uh, as objects of devotion and uh, as, uh, as centers of our uh, of prayer all along the way. And so I got so, you, you can't walk, you can't go into the churches or, or the monasteries of the Camino without being struck by the beauty of the Blessed Mother as you encounter her. Even Our Lady Guadalupe, she's everywhere, uh, all along the way. This is the image of Virgen, La Virgen del Camino. This is in the Dominican shrine of La Virgen del Camino in outside the city of Leon. Uh, and it's a medieval image of the Pieta and, very, and, 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 and uh, there are blessings given for pilgrims uh, at this Dominican shrine every day. And I spent two days there with the Dominicans of Spain while I was walking along the way. So there's all these beautiful images of Spain that exist throughout. Well, there's this one that I kept seeing that I didn't know about. And I should have known about her, but I didn't until I encountered her in Spain. And you see this image in lots of churches, on lots of side altars. And I began to look at the little, where, there were, where there were name tags that said what the devotion was. I began to see this and I began to see Nuestra Señora de, de Pilar, so Our Lady of the Pillar. And so, and when I looked at the image very often, if you back out from it, so this is the, image, the same image, but backed out, you see there's always another figure with it as well. I didn't know what this was. The more I looked though, the more I found, if you look on the shoulder left, as you look at the screen on the left shoulder of this image, you see the scallop shell. That's a symbol of Santiago. This is the Blessed Mother and Santiago. And so I had to look up what it was. I had to learn why Santiago is always depicted with Our Lady the Pillar, and I did. So the story goes that when St. James was preaching in Spain, he became discouraged because he wasn't winning very many, uh, very many converts. In fact, the story says after seven years, he only had seven converts. And he was praying on the banks of the Ebro River in, four, in the year 40. 
And while he was praying, the Blessed Mother appeared to him. Now, Mary was still alive, so technically this is not an apparition, although it's sometimes called the first apparition uh, of, of, of the Blessed Mother. But it's technically not an apparition, it's a bilocation. She was still alive and in Jerusalem, and so she appeared, uh, she appeared with, uh, uh, with the, she appeared uh, in two places at one time, she appeared miraculously to St. James to encourage him and tell him that the Lord was going to make his work successful beyond his imagining by offering, and she left, when she, when she disappeared, she left this pillar with this image of, uh, of, of herself uh, as an object of devotion. And so, uh, so this is the church of, uh, this is one of the largest churches in the world. It's the church, uh, the Basilica of Our Lady of the Pillar, Nuestra Señora de Pilar. That's on the Ebro River in Zaragoza. And Zaragoza was not on my pilgrimage route when I, when I walked Camino, but after I finished the Camino, I still had some more time in Spain. And I went to Zaragoza to see this and to see the, the actual devotional uh, image of the Blessed Mother uh, that you see there on the screen as well. Uh, so, so what I had here now was not just, um, not just a story about Mary appearing not just a great devotion that spread all throughout Spain, but I had a direct connection now between Santiago and the Blessed Mother, a direct connection between the two objects of my, of, of my devotion that were already a part of who I was, a, a, part, a part of why I was walking this Camino. Uh, I had experienced discouragement. I injured my foot and, I, and so there was a point at which I needed encouragement and I was able to look to Our Lady of the Pillar as a sign and source of encouragement. But most of all, this concrete connection between Santiago and the Blessed Mother. And the more I walked and the longer I continued to reflect on the life of Santiago, what happened was I began to reflect on the episodes, the instances of James's presence in the scriptures I begin to reflect on those as mysteries of the rosary. And I developed a new system of praying the rosary, not to replace the old one, but for my pilgrimage, that I would pray mysteries associated with St. James. I called them the Santiago mysteries. Some of them were related to the ministerial life of Jesus and James's presence with Jesus. And then the glorification of Jesus and the establishment of his church, uh, beginning with the transfiguration, uh, his discussions of the end time in Luke's gospel, the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the post-resurrection appearances and the Great Commission. And then what I would call the evangelization ministries, the ministries, uh, the uh, evangeliz evangelization mysteries. Uh, James preaches the gospel in Spain, the apparition of Nuestro Señora de, de, de Pilar, James's own martyrdom, the finding of James's relics uh, in Spain, and the Camino de Santiago itself. And so I began to reflect on these as a way, on these as my, the mysteries with which I prayed the rosary and reflecting on what these had to teach me about uh, the ministerial life that I've taken on as an apostolic follower of Jesus, uh, what it means to live the glory that Jesus wants us to live uh, as, we, as, we, uh, as we walk closer with him and as we discover more and more about that call and the, the ministry of evangelization that each of us is sent to as Christians. And so I was very, very blessed to begin to weave together Marian devotion as part of who I am as a Dominican. I prayed the regular mysteries of the rosary as, as well while I was walking, but I prayed these special mysteries, the Santiago mysteries to help me get to know St. James more and to make that, to continue to make that concrete, uh, 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 concrete connection to between the Blessed Mother and Saint and Santiago. I share with you just a little bit more before I start to answer questions about my arrival in Santiago. Uh, after walking for forty days, uh, I arrived on the Mount of Hope, the Mount of Joy. Uh, they call it. Uh, it's the mountain where you first get your first glimpse of the Cathedral of Santiago, even on the cloudy day, as I, uh, this is very early in the morning, but you can see right there over my head, uh, if you look closely, you can see the tower of the cathedral in the distance. I still had a little, well, a little walk to make. I eventually went into the town of Santiago at this portal, made my way to the cathedral, uh, because that's what, you, that's what you do. You go to the cathedral first, 
there I expressed my joy of, uh, of arriving after all that time. I should not have made this picture jumping uh, because I had broken my foot and I needed not to be jumping on it. But I did because I was so happy to be there. I went to the cathedral and visited the relics of St. James, visited the 13th century, uh, the 13th century gilded jeweled image of St. James that's over the high altar. You're, you can go up behind that and you can see here a close up picture of the back of that sculpture and, and uh, pilgrims are encouraged to kiss and hug the statue of St. James, which I did, Mito Cayo. And then I waved to pilgrims who were out there in the church uh, while I was uh, up there as well, because you know that's what I do. Then I found a place to pray. And this was the altar that I would use as my prayer space uh, during the, the week that I spent in Santiago after my arrival. It was a special altar and I, I was so happy to find it. You can't see it in this picture very clearly, but what's, what's in the center of that is an image of Our Lady of the Pillar. And so I've been, I've been especially blessed to learn about Our Lady of the Pillar and to incorporate her into my spirituality of pilgrimage at this moment. But then also, if you look just to the left, uh, as you look at this picture, just to the left on that altar, uh, the image that's there is the image of St. Dominic. So, I knew, this was, I knew this was my prayer place. I knew this was the place that I had to pray. And so I had, uh, I had found my place and each day I attended the pilgrim mass, but in addition to attending the pilgrim mass, I also, uh, I also uh, continued to pray my Santiago, my Santiago mysteries. And Mary became as much a part of my pilgrimage as was uh, my, my uh, learning more and more about my patron saint. St. James. So I hope this has been, uh, I hope this has been interesting for you. There are many different ways that I can talk about the Camino. It was such a remarkable experience and I was so blessed to have that, to, to have the experience uh, uh, and to have the time, the energy and the, um, uh, and the resources to be able to make, to make the journey. Um, and it was an especially enriching time for, uh, growing in my relationship with Jesus, growing in my relationship with his apostle James, and growing in relationship with his blessed mother. So I'm going to drop the uh, share now and put my face up here. And um, maybe, let's see, maybe there's, some, oh, there's some questions that have come in. So I'm going to, um, going to bring up those questions now. Okay, so um, so Mario Garcia in uh, in um, St. Dominic's Church in Eagle Rock, our, the Dominican parish in Los Angeles, asked how many miles on average did you walk every day? Uh, I, it, it varied between between twelve and twenty four. Uh, the sh my shortest day was twelve. Actually, I did have one day where I only walked walk eight miles, but I was not feeling well that day, and I chose to walk a short distance. But most days, between twelve and twenty four miles. Twenty four was a long day. Uh, I tended to average somewhere around 19, 18, 19, which I think is is reasonable. You can make reservation. Then somebody else, uh, Mario asks also, also, can you ask make reservations in advance? For uh, for the uh, um, for the places that you walk every day, you can do that. Some people do that. I did for part of the pilgrimage, especially after I'd injured my foot. I needed to walk each. I needed to stop each day, and and I needed to pass my pack along. Uh, there were couriers that will carry your pack for you if you need them to, and uh, and so in order to have your to have your pack carried uh, to a new place, you have to have a place uh, reserved, and so. Uh, so the last seven days, I, I did make reservations. Most days, I just went and found a place, and I only had problem one time, and that one time, I ended up sleeping on the floor uh, of, a, of the last albergue in town. So, uh, but most, most, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pilgrims don't make reservations ahead of time. Okay, so that was Mario's answer. Answered Mario's question. Okay, um, then let's see. Joseph Denzel from San Ramon, California asks, uh, how is the trip planned? Do you just show up and start walking? Are reservations needed to participate in hostels? I just answered that question. 
about reservations. Um, I met a man from England uh, who I became uh, who became dear friends during that time. That's part of the part of the experience is the people that you meet along the way. It's just so amazing, and I'm still now six years later, five years later still in touch with many of the people that I met on the Camino. One man that I met was sitting at home with his wife. He was in his 70s, he's retired. He was sitting home with his wife on Tuesday. They saw a piece on the television about uh, the Camino and, uh, and he looked at her and said, uh, would you ever wanna do that? And she said, hell no. And, and he said, would you mind if I did it? She said, no, she said, that'd be fine. And he started walking on Friday. He, had, he made no planning, no preparation, no nothing. And he was a trooper. He, and he's gone back and walked several times since uh, the first time when I met him. Uh, but it, it, pe some people wanna plan everything along the way. Uh, I met a priest from Canada who had walked before and over planned and carried too many things. He was walking a second time when I met him and he had a very small backpack. He had basically a change of underwear and t-shirt every day and a change of socks. Uh, and, and that's all he walked with because he knows that you're walking in the first world and you can get almost everything you need in every town you go through. And so uh, there are people who want to, um, uh, there are people who want to, uh, to walk, uh, who want to plan everything. And there are other people that really feel like it's, uh, it's, it's depending, trusting in God's providence to not do that. Okay. Um, So Virginia from Alaska asked me how old I was when I knew I had a vocation. Well, I'm 58. I'm getting pretty sure now. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I have, um, uh, uh, my vocation story really begins uh, with uh, conversion to Catholicism when I was 24 and, uh, and then deciding to work for the church as a lay person. Uh, I entered the order when I was 28, and at that point, I was fairly sure, uh, I, I was pretty sure that I had a vocation, um, and uh, that's 30 years ago this year, so it's working out, it's working out, so, so far it's working out, I think. Okay. Uh, my friend Cara from, Cara from uh, Antioch says hello, and Buen Camino, she walked the Camino uh, at, since I did. Joseph Denzel, uh, do the Dominican communities along the Camino host pilgrims? N no, in general. Uh, the, one at, the one in Leon at, at La Virgen del Camino has associated with, has a, 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 an albergue, a hostel associated with it. Uh, and the Dominicans certainly hosted me. There were three Dominican communities that I stayed with in uh, um, one in, um, in Pamplona, one in Burgos, and one in Leon, and they, they welcomed me as a Dominican, uh, and those were places, those are bigger cities that I wanted to see, I wanted to do some tourism and visiting uh, places while I was there, so I stayed an extra day and used their, uh, used their laundry facilities and uh, ate with them and enjoyed the, enjoyed the hospitality of the community for a couple of days uh, in each of those bigger cities uh, along the way. Uh, unfortunately, that's not available, that's not generally available for for pilgrims, but there are plenty of places to stay in all of those in all those big cities, certainly. Hi, Becky Murphy from Atlanta. Uh, she's a good friend. Uh, and she asked me if I ever felt lonely, uh, and that I ever feel like there were too many distractions. Um, and how do I overcome them, those experiences to focus on the spiritual journey? Well, I'm an extrovert. Extroverts welcome extraction, distractions. We, we, aren't, uh, um, we don't see them necessarily always as a negative thing. I would say I was never lonely at all. There were, I walked by myself. I didn't go with a group or a friend, but I met people along the way and I chose to walk in the morning by myself. So most of the mornings I would be, uh, at least until that first coffee break, I would be by myself. And that was my prayer time. That was my focus, my, my focus spiritual time. Uh, and then after lunch or as, as the walk went on, I would tend to join people that I'd met before or meet new people or people that I met when I stopped for lunch and walk with them. And those were, those were I mean, I was wearing my habit, so I was identifiable as a friar and as a priest. And so those were moments where I ministered to people. Those were moments where people ministered to me. And so there was certainly no loneliness in that. And the distractions were opportunities to share with people to talk with to them about why they were doing this and what they were expecting to see. I met amazing people on the way. I'm, uh, I walked for a long time with a, um, a, uh, um, 
an Episcopal, uh, excuse me, an Anglican minister from New Zealand and his wife. Uh, and uh, again, still in touch uh, with them today. And, but, but just marvelous sharing of experiences, sharing of our life together. They were, they are my, more or less my age and we were, and, and his life is similar to mine in the sense of, in the sense that he's, he spends his life in ministry and, and able to share those things, but also able to share deeply in spirituality. It was amazing how many Protestants I met along the way that I, that I made great connections with, in addition to the Catholics that I met along the way. Much of my ministry uh, as a, um, as a Dominican has been in university ministry. And so uh, ministering to young people along the way, uh, walking with young people who are, who are in various stages of their own spiritual journey, talking with them about that, sharing with them. And again, just, just the, the marvelous gift of, of the internet makes it possible to continue to be in touch with so many of those people after that time. So distractions, yes, uh, but I, I didn't see those things as a bad thing. They were part of the experience as well. Okay, Roger Bueno, who is from our parish in Benicia. What kind of physical preparations did you do before your trip? Uh, I did walk a lot. I, walking has been my primary mode of physical exercise uh, in my adult life. And so I, I walked a lot uh, and a lot more. I walked in the boots that I was gonna be walking in. Um, I did, a, did a, just, just making sure that I could walk up hills and down hills. Um, if I were going to walk again, and I don't know that I ever will, but if I were going to walk again, I would certainly uh, do some some physical training ahead of time, just to uh, uh, just to make sure that that uh, you know that I that I can walk up those hills. That because there there's there's uh, there's serious elevation changes that you make in a number of places along the way, and so um, I had been on sabbatical already when I walked the Camino. I'd been on sabbatical for almost a year already. And I'd done quite a bit of walking when I, in the part of my sabbatical that I spent in the Holy Land, I walked from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, I walked the Jesus Trail. So these were places, so these are other, other walking pilgrimages that I did, but mostly just, just walking. There are a lot of people that don't do any preparation ahead of time and just see it as going out for a walk. Uh, and I would say some of those people are happy that, are okay that they didn't, other people, uh, other people are very sad that they didn't and wish that they had done some training ahead of time. So Valerie Baker uh, asked this question. Um, Hello, Father Bart, this is Valerie from Hayward. Just want to clarify, is it better to start from Lourdes or to go there after arriving at the cathedral? Sixes, I, I, I would say um, I wanted to start there because it's Lourdes is very close to the starting place for the Camino. So that's why I chose to start there. Uh, my worst walking experiences by far were walking in France before I got to the Spanish border. The signage is not as good in France as it is in Spain. The, I, there were no other pilgrims. I saw no, I did not see a single pilgrim the whole time. I was walk, the week I was walking in France before I got to Saint-Jean. Uh, and so it was very disheartening. Uh, I'm an extrovert. Being able to talk with people at some point in the day about my experience is, is an important part of the way that I uh, that I interact with the world. Uh, and so it was hard. And it also, it was raining. It was raining cats and dogs. Um, again, I was trying to wear my habit every day. And there were a couple of days that I couldn't because I, I'd gotten, it had gotten so muddy the day before from, the, from walking in, in the woods that I just, didn't, I just couldn't get it clean to wear it the next day. And so, uh, but then again, I said, I didn't have any rain after the 1st of May the whole month that I walked in May, uh, rain wasn't an issue. But in, uh, so France, um, France was tough. It was, it was tough. Uh, although the, the albergues, the places that I stayed were great. One place that I, had, that I had planned to stay wasn't open and I just stayed in a hotel in that town. And that's, that's you just make, you, you just roll with the punches uh, as you go. But I do think that going to Lourdes after you go to Santiago is a great, is a great thing. There's a couple of other shrines in Spain that are great um, at, uh, uh, at uh, Covadonga in the mountains nor in the north of Spain, and uh, um, and um, Peña de Francia is a is a Marian uh, a Marian shrine that's run by the Dominicans uh, uh, just south of, of south of Santiago near Salamanca, and so uh, um, so those are both other shrines, and then of course uh, Lourdes is is not far south from there either. So some people will go to Lourdes or go to, excuse me to Fatima or to Lourdes uh, after they after they make the pilgrimage as a treat for themselves. OK. 
Okay. Father Peter Rogers. Do I know him? Father Peter Rogers is my boss at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. He's the president. He said, what effects did the spirituality gain during this pilgrimage have on you as a Dominican preacher? Um, I think that, um, again, part of what motivated my own, my own experience was my Dominican life. Again, I walked in my habit, which the choice to walk in the habit was, was because I was on a spiritual exercise, I felt that I should. It was, it was an invitation for some people. It was a wall for other people. There were people that didn't, that, that sort of stayed away from me because they didn't know what this, you know, what this white robe was. Uh, but ultimately, uh, in terms of preaching, I would say it, it, it gave me material, it gave me things to talk about, it gave, every pilgrimage I've ever been on, whether it was the Holy Land or Lourdes or Rome or, uh, or uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, all those places, I, I come back with, with, uh, uh, with stories, with, uh, with examples and illustrations that I can use in my preaching, but also just that sense that, that sense that, that what, um, uh, what the encouragement that we need, especially in moments of discouragement, uh, and, and doing the hard thing is not, is, is it, it, you do it, even though it's hard and you, you push your way through it and, uh, and, and the Lord rewards, the Lord gives, uh, graces because of that. And so I would say that's true in the spirit, in my spiritual life and in my preacher, my preacher life and my Dominican life as well. Uh, I have, I have lots of support from my patron saints, from people like St. James and St. Bartholomew and, um, and, the, uh, uh, and the Blessed Mother, especially Our Lady the Pillar. And uh, again, that her whole purpose of meeting St. James in Spain at that moment was to encourage him at a moment when he was discouraged. And I have to be reminded, and what I've reminded people in preaching in my preaching as well, is that our idea of success is not necessarily the idea that God, James could not have imagined what Santiago would become over the course of the second century of Christianity, excuse me, the second millennium of Christianity. He could not have imagined it. And yet the, Our Lady consoled him and gave him encouragement, and he was able to, uh, to continue in his ministry and then eventually return to Jerusalem where he was martyred. So I'm really, uh, uh, I'm really happy to, um, uh, to um, I'm really, I, I, I'm just so inspired by all the experiences along the way. And I, I'm a, people know I'm a photographer. I take lots of pictures and my pictures, um, uh, I, I go back and look at the 10,000 pictures that I took while I was on the Camino and I continue to be inspired by them uh, and inspired in my spiritual life by them as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Millie Estrada, a friend of mine from, Ant from Antioch, asked if I'm planning to lead a pilgrimage to the Camino. No, I'm not. Uh, I would be open to, I'd be open to maybe leading a group uh, on the short 100 kilometer portion of the C Camino at the end. But part of doing that was, uh, was uh, um, uh, part of doing that was, was a spiritual exercise for myself where I wasn't leading other pilgrims. Uh, and so I want to, keep that as, as, uh, as, as part of my own personal spirituality. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so, Barbara Daniels, how did St. James, James Bones appear in Spain? Okay, so the story is that after St. James, after the Blessed Mother appeared to St. James, uh, he returned to Israel and he was martyred by Herod uh, in 44 AD. And somehow, miraculously, his bones were, were transported from that place, from Israel, where he was martyred, to Spain, where he had ministered. And there's a couple of different stories. One is they were carried by angels uh, in a, um, they were carried by angels, just angels took them. A second story is they were, they were carried by his disciples in an angelic guided uh, stone ship that took them there. The stories are, the story, there are lots of stories, but somehow miraculously his relics were moved from Israel to, uh, to, uh, to the, western, the western coast of Spain, uh, where, they were, where they were hidden, buried and hidden for, uh, for eight centuries uh, and eventually revealed by God to this particular shepherd. Now, there are a lot of people that want to say that's just legend. There's not, I, I, 
I'm okay with legend. I'm okay with pious tradition. I'm okay with not knowing exactly how they got there. Uh, I'm okay with God doing miracles with things like saints, with uh, apostles relics. And so I don't know exactly how they got there. There's lots of stories, but somehow miraculously they were transported from Israel to Spain and then later discovered uh, in, the, uh, in, in the place where Santiago is today. Um, Andrea, another friend uh, who's in North Carolina, I think, and she says, uh, what is your feeling about walking in pieces and not all at once? Do you think you can get the same feel? I'm supposed to be there now. Yeah, my, she, that's right, Andrea told me she was supposed to be there now, but many people's trips were canceled this year. Europeans very often walk the Camino from their home in Poland or in their home in France or their home in, in Italy or their home in Germany. They walk from there and they walk, uh, they walk when they have vacation in a particular summer. So they'll walk from point A to point B in one summer during their vacation. And the next year, they'll go back and walk from point B to point C. And then the next year from point C to point D. So they do it in, in pieces like that uh, because, uh, because that's what they can afford. They can afford the time to do it one, uh, um, you know, over, over a longer period of time. Americans tend to do it all at one time because it costs us so much to get to Spain. If you're going to pay fifteen hundred dollars for a plane ticket to Spain or a thousand dollars for a ticket to Spain, you're going to you're going to take your whole vacation for a, for a particular time and try to do it. The reasonable time for walking the five hundred mile route is thirty six days. I think doing it in fewer days than that is crazy. Or you're really young. Young people can do it, but people middle aged people uh, trying to do it unless you're in just really, really great shape, trying to do it in fewer than 36 days is probably a bit much. Uh, uh, Shelly Garrett asks if I speak Spanish and, and if I speak French. I speak Spanish and I speak French some. Uh, I spoke Spanish a lot when I was on the Camino. The Camino, their English is, is one of the languages that spoke everywhere. It's spoken everywhere though. So if you don't speak Spanish, it won't. Uh, um, it won't harm your experience because there's so much English speaking that goes on there. Uh, but yes, I am very, I'm blessed. Part of the reason that I was in Spain for that time, uh, my sabbatical was really beefing up the Spanish language. And while my Spanish is not perfect, uh, I'm very grateful to be able to preach and minister in Spanish now. My French is not nearly as good as it was years ago, right after I'd studied French, but, uh, but I'm, I, I get along okay uh, uh, when I need to use French as well. <clears throat> Uh, did you visit the birthplace of St. Of Dominic? So this is uh, Wayne Berry asking me if I visited the, the birthplace of St. Dominic, Calaruega, Burgos, and the monastery near Santo Domingo de Silos. So I was, uh, I did not do that while I was on the Camino because I did it outside of my experience. You know, I was there studying for six months and I had classes Monday through Friday and then I had the weekends free and I traveled. I just went everywhere. I, I was very blessed to have the resources as part of my as part of my sabbatical to visit places like Avila and Segovia and uh, Lourdes and other places in Portugal and uh, Sevilla and I had been to Barcelona before I started my study so I did I, I was able to go all over and one of one weekend I did a, uh, a, um, a visit to the places associated with Saint Dominic in the north of Spain uh, all the places that you just mentioned Burgo, uh, Osme de Burgos uh, Calaruega and Santo Domingo de Silos are places that are associated with his life and ministry. And yes, those were amazing experiences to be able to connect with. I, I, I love pilgrimaging. I, I, I do regular pilgrimages to the Holy Land uh, when there's not a coronavirus keeping me from doing so. I do, um, I, I've done pilgrimages to, personal pilgrimages to Medjugorje and Lourdes and uh, and uh, um, Our Lady Guadalupe last summer. Uh, I've been to, to yeah, I've done uh, uh, with young people, I've done, I've done pilgrimages to other places. I pilgrimage to pilgrimage sites in the United States and there are lots of pilgrimage sites in the United States. Um, one of them uh, uh, just a few hours away in, in, uh, um, in Carmel by the sea, we actually have a saint who's buried in Carmel, Saint Unipro Serra. And so that is a pilgrimage place. And yet people, I think we think of it as a tourist place, but we don't think of it as a place to go and pray. And so yes, all of these places are because of the way that I learned history. I learned history more from going places than I do from reading it in books. And so walking in the places that Jesus walked in the Holy Land, 
walking in the places that St. Dominic walked in Spain. These are all very precious, precious memories for me uh, that are part of uh, the way that I connect with, uh, with my spirituality. Let's see if I've answered all of these questions. I have answered, it looks like I've answered all of the questions that people recorded on their, um, are there any final questions or comments? Since this was a presentation about my walking the Camino as a Marian devotion, I'd like to end by asking you to pray with me a Hail Mary. So Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to put, the, um, put the screen share back up for a moment. And... invite you to be a part of the uh, the next installment of Wise Habits, which will be uh, in November. And there's more, there'll be more information uh, coming from, um, oh, well, coming uh, regarding that. I'm going to um, okay. So I'm going to turn this back over to Brian and Heidi, and uh, thank you for, again, thank you for your attention. Uh, I can be reached at frbart at gmail.com, uh, or I can be reached through DSPT, and, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to share my experience of the Camino with you, and I hope that, uh, I, I hope that uh, it's been a blessing for you, and that this new series, The Wise Habits, can continue to be a blessing for you as well. Thank you, Father Bart, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope you'll join us uh, next month for our next uh, Wise Habits talk. So good night and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you. <laughs>